Today my guest is Scott Hunter. Scott, how are you, sir? Good, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for being on my show. Yeah, you are. Um, uh, you, what's your job? Um, I am a program manager at Microsoft on the web platform team. So I'm, I'm uh, the areas that I'm involved in is I work on ASP.NET, I work on Visual Web Developer, I work on Web Matrix. Um, pretty much any combination of those three things is, is what I work on. That's a huge uh, area of space. In fact, a lot of that touches me. I'm a web developer myself. I do a lot of ASP.NET, a lot of MVC. Um, and uh, I'm getting involved heavily in ASP.NET 4. And you're heavily involved in ASP.NET 4.5. ASP. 4.5. 4. 4. 4. 4. 4. 4. Next version. Yes. Uh, give us an idea. What's coming down the pike? Um, to me, some of the coolest things we have coming in, in uh, ASP.NET 4.5 uh, are going to be the web optimization work that we're doing. So one of the things we've looked at is uh, historically we had in web forms we had something called a script manager. And we actually added uh, some, some abilities in it to actually do script compression and, and combination way back uh, in version 3.5. But it was so hard to use that people never really adopted it. I found it a little bit clunky. These are basically server-side controls that uh, kind of emit JavaScript or control JavaScript. They do, they do that, but they also do all the minification combination. You can create what they call composite sets, um, what now we call bundles in the, in the new model. Um, and where we try to be really different in the new, in the new code is you know, number, there's a couple things so that the uh, script manager that you're talking about, when, when it actually emits the script to the page, it's going to generate a, a web resource.axt um, URL in your page, which is hard to, re hard to read, hard to understand what is that until you, like, unless you paste that URL in your browser, you wouldn't know what it, what it is. So a couple of our goals were, number one, to not have ugly markup. We want to have very pretty markup. And then number two, we want to just work by convention. And by work by convention, I don't want to require the customer to actually have to go and configure what's a what is a bundle. Um, I want to just say, put some scripts in a folder, reference the folder, so scripts slash, you know, my bundle, okay. and we'll automatically minify, compress, and combine all the files in that folder. Okay, so I, saw, I actually saw this earlier, but I don't think I quite got it. The, if I put a bunch of JavaScript files in a particular folder, and then I, I have a script tag that points to that folder, not only will all those files be put into my, into my page, but they're going to be compressed along the way. They'll right? be, they'll be, minified, and they'll be minified and compressed along the way. Okay. Well, that's, that's and you'll only have, and you only have one file, so you're going to have, you know, you'll have the one file. Okay. So only um, one, re one request. One request. The whole idea is, you know, if you have like a, a folder, our, our default projects in MVC today have like six uh, script files. Right. That's six requests per page to go suck those things down. Yeah. In the new model, you're going to bring down one file. Okay. Um, and as it's I said, it's, 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 it's by convention. The, the, the main goal of that was to have clean URLs and then to be by convention so the customer doesn't really have to, you know, do something manually. Now, we do have all the dials to manually do it as well. You can go into your startup file or your global ACX file, and you can create a bundle and say, I want this script and that script and this script and that script, and you can come up with whatever name you want to call that URL, and, and you reference that URL, um, we'll return that result for you. Okay. Uh, what else is coming out in 4.5? Um, so that was one of the, uh, the big things that's cool. Uh, something else that's coming out in 4.5 that I'm, I'm excited about, it does require Windows 8, uh, but it's, it's going to be uh, WebSocket support. So HTML5 WebSockets is a, is, a, is a core feature of HTML5. Um, and kind of the notion there is, traditionally on the web, if you do something like a chat app or something, it's going to be doing a poll every five seconds or 10 seconds, it's going to open a connection, see if there's some data, uh, and, and then close it and then try again. Right. With WebSockets, things become much more efficient because we can basically keep the connection open the entire time, and as uh, something on one end has more data, it just gets pushed down the pipe. Is this something that's uh, really more designed for our browser applications, built on top of Windows 8, or are these browser applications where the client just has to be running Windows 8? Um, the server operating system has to be running Windows 8. Oh, server, okay. So the, what about the client? The client can run uh, any browser that supports uh, HTML5 WebSockets. Oh, okay, I see. So right now, I know the latest version of Firefox supports them. The, the, they just released a new Chrome like a week ago. It might now support them as well. Okay. Um, the IE that we've been showing as part of Windows 8 supports WebSockets as well. It's IE10, I think. I, I ten, yes. Okay. So I think you can assume that the next generation of every, every web browser will support it. Um, we've built a framework on top of WebSockets called SignalR. Um, SignalR is kind of a pub-sub mechanism where um, 
once again, you can think of the chat app, where as you sign in, you're basically subscribing to the chat channel. Okay. And then when somebody types something, it gets sent to everybody. What's uh, Signal R? You can actually grab that today. Um, if you just Google Signal R and uh, .net, you'll get it'll land you on the on the project page. You want to say Google? On I did say Google. <laughs> um, I've never heard of Google before. Signal R is pretty cool because what it does is it supports both polling and websites. Hmm. Okay. Meaning that um, for older browsers or older servers. Yes. So the cool thing is you write your application one time using Signal R's API. And then under the covers, it will actually use the best implementation you can find. Uh, so if the server supports the WebSockets and the browser supports WebSockets, you're using WebSockets. No, this is a graceful it, degradation. Yes. So the All right, great. Uh, what else? Um, so we've done those two. Um, a lot of web forms work is in, in core five. Yeah. Uh, so this is a, an area that um, there's a little confusion around. Uh, web forms is still alive now. A lot yes. of people using it. Are, are you encouraging people to? To new web developers to build in uh, web forms, or are you pushing them more into MVC? I, I kind of, I, I guess I'm, I live on the agnostic world. Use whatever tool best fits your needs. Um, you know, I just did a talk here and talked a lot about Razor, which is a, we have three ways of building apps in, in ASP.NET today. We have web pages. Web pages, I, I would argue, is our simplest and quickest way to build web pages. In web pages, you just have a single file, a CSHTML file, and inside that file, both your logic. And your markup uh, would exist. Okay, kind of, kind of very similar to classic ASG. Sure. Uh, the main goal was to, to use the razor syntax and to have very low concept count of programming. Okay, um, be attractive to a PHP or Ruby developer, etc. Right. Then we have the web forms and we have the MVC stacks. Um, and once again, I, I think use the right tool for what you're trying to build. You know, for, for example, if you said go build me a reporting site really quickly, I would probably use web forms. If you said go build me a 600 page, uh, you know, large site that I'm going to maintain for a long, long time, um, I would probably go use, I would probably go down the MVC route. Okay. Right, Mainly so. because MVC is enforcing better, better practices on me okay. um, to make a site that hopefully would be more main, maintainable right. um, in the long run. Um, it also, a lot depends on what kind of developer you are. If you're a nuts and bolts HTML JavaScript developer, yeah, MVC is probably going to feel better for you because yeah. it's going to get you closer to that. While if you're not really a web developer or don't have a lot of web, web background or you have desktop programming background experience, web forms is then web forms is going to feel more natural to you. And I, I, I think they're both viable and we're going, to, we're going to continue to support them both. And what we're doing in 4.5 is we're actually taking a lot of the features that we had in MVC over the years and bringing them back into web forms. So we did unobtrusive validation, that we have in, in MVC is now in web forms. Model binding, which was in MVC, um, is now in web forms. Um, you know, those uh, granular control of request validation, uh, which we, we added in MVC 3, will now be in web forms. And so what you see is, I, I think people get confused when they, when they think about our investments because web forms can only ship every three years, two or three years, whenever a framework comes along. Okay. Um, it is in system.web. Uh, we actually tried to take it out of system.web once before, but it's so intertwined in that, in that assembly that there's no way to get it out of there. I didn't realize that. So that's the reason that uh, MVC can be more agile, because they've got their own yes. DLLs and their own namespaces. Yeah. MVC ships as its, as its own, and in fact, we purposely have not put it in the core framework, because once we put it in the, the core framework, it would follow the same ship cycles as, as web forms. That's not to say that when we get to MVC 5 or 6, at some point, MVC might be so mature that we're not making high level changes anymore and, and maybe that actually makes sense. It's more or less baked at that point. It's, it's baked at that point. I mean, once again, you know, it's a Microsoft product and the way Microsoft products work is we, we strive very heavily to have great backwards compatibility. At some point that prevents you from, you know, growing in some, some sure, ways. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I would love to, if, if I was allowed to do so, we would go hatch it out of web forms, a lot of the things that we think are bad practices in web forms. Um, that would break a lot of existing websites. Yes, and, and if, I, if we'll ever be allowed to have that kind of breaking change, I don't know, but we would love to do it. The team would love to just go and, hey, guess what, HTML5 doesn't allow you know, all these uh, inline styles anymore. So let's just remove those properties from the base controls. We would, we would love to do that. Um, but, but the reality is um, we're investing in these things uh, equally, but as I said, web forms can only come around every three years, two or three years, whenever a framework comes. So 
I think people perceive it different because they say, hey man, NPC is like two, three, four. So um, well, let's talk about um, when we're going to see 4.5. This is, um, this is going to come out with a new version of Visual Studio, right? Yeah, those products will ship together. Obviously, visual frameworks and Visual Studio will always ship together. Okay, and is that at any time table with set? I can't talk about that. Uh, how about uh, the beta? That's, that's can't talk about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, well, uh, Visual Studio has enhancements that are kind of tied in. We'll think, uh, a lot of people think of them together. The new framework comes out, the new Visual Studio comes Yeah, so, well, I, do, I do want to talk about two more features that we have in the framework first, which is okay. one of the things is obviously as we start moving towards cloud scenarios, we start thinking about what is our, how long does it take ASP.NET to start up? Okay. The first time a request comes into your website, how long does it take for things to launch? Um, and so we've actually got improvements of about 30% on cold start times um, in .NET 4.5. Um, even more so if you're on uh, Windows 8. Um, some of those happen because we actually took some of, the, some of the features that exist in the desktop operating system today. There's a feature where your, your Windows 7 box will actually say, hey, I know that you load Word every day. And so when your machine boots up, I'm going to start. Re I'm going to start preloading uh, Word DLLs into memory. Oh, okay. Um, and so we have that same functionality now on the server side, where we can actually have when the machine comes up, it can start automatically loading all the things that run all the time, like us. Okay. Um, which will which will start up time. And another thing. Another thing we did is we uh, were able to cut down our memory footprint by about 30 percent as well. Hmm. Um, a couple of techniques were done for, done done to do that. And one was to be more aggressive in throwing memory away. Okay. Um, we call it kind of frugal mode. Um, to be a little bit more frugal and try to push things away faster. Um, another one, which especially is great for hosters, is let's say you're a hoster and um, your machine's got 700 sites on it and they're all running in Brocco uh, or, or some similar software. Right. Brocco's a content management system. It's a content management system, uh, a common one. I mean, there's, there's other ones. There's Orchard, one, one that we, we wrote. Um, but if you have a lot of sites using that same exact uh, app, what actually happens today is each instance loads its own version of those assemblies. Wow. And so... That's a waste. It's a waste, especially when you start doing times 100, times 200, times 500. And so we have a, a feature called, uh, we call it bin interning. And there's a tool you write, you run, ASP, ASP.NET uh, underscore uh, bin intern, or actually ASP.NET under intern. Okay. And what that does is it will actually go look at all the websites on the machine, figure out which ones have assemblies that are the same assembly, and kind of do some semblance between them. So uh, yeah, okay. it kind of tricks the system into um, only loading the assembly once. Is there a trade-off of fault tolerance when you do that? No. Okay. So no, 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 there's no trade-offs there. So um, that's that's an interesting thing. And then probably the final thing that I, I, I wanted that, that I, I missed earlier that is important is. Our team recently reworked into, uh, we're now called the Azure Application Platform Team. Okay. Um, we used to be the Web Platform and Tools Team. Um, and so what happened was Scott Guthrie uh, used to be in DevDiv, which is the team that basically builds Visual Studio. And when he was over there, he had the .NET Framework, and he had uh, Silverlight, and various other pieces of, of technology. Um, we're now all in a group called the Azure Application Platform Team. And basically building the infrastructure for, for Azure. So there's parts of my team that work on the SDKs that we'll get. Um, obviously, we work on the runtimes, be it ASP.NET, NBC. We're going to make our, our products run well in Azure. Um, so one of the things that we, we did in, 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 in the new framework and in NBC4 is the default membership, profile, role systems that are built into ASP.NET have never supported cloud scenarios. Um, they basically were tied to, they were written against SQL Server 2000, and they've kind of been patched along the ways, but they're, they're still that kind of error. Um, and so what we did is we wrote new providers that are based on Unity Framework. The reason we did them in Unity Framework is there's a provider model behind that, meaning that, that we can write the provider one time and support any database that Unity Framework supports, okay. which ends up being like 20 or 30 databases versus the one. Oh, okay. we support that today. That could be SQL Azure, for example. That could be SQL Azure. So in our case, the things that interest us are SQL Azure, SQL Server, and SQL Compact. And all three of those are now supported you know, out of the box. We're going to talk about some of the enhancements of Visual Studio. Let's talk about some of the enhancements of Visual Studio. <laughs> uh, the next of Visual Studio. Is, it, uh, is there a name for it yet? Uh, 
Developer 11 preview. Is Developer 11 preview. Okay, let's uh, uh, so <laughs> Dev 11. We'll, we'll, we'll call it Dev 11. So what's, what's better about Dev 11 than um, Dev 10? Well, I, I'm only thinking from the from the web perspective. Uh, there's a couple things from the web perspective that oh. I think are, that, are, that are pretty cool. Um, first off, never before has has people don't realize that every type of file you open is not really a first class citizen inside of Visual Studio. So, for okay. example, you know if you go into like a CSS file or a JS file. You don't get all the same functionality that you get inside of a C sharp file or a okay. Ruby file. But the, the excellent IntelliSense is it's better in some files. In, IntelliSense is one thing, but it also it's like, can you block indent? Can you block unindent? Can you comment, block comment? Can you block uncomment? Does it do outlining, collapsing? And a lot of that is the fact that it doesn't understand the syntax of those files. Yeah, a, lot, a lot of it just is that we never have written support for those types of files in Visual Studio. And so one of our goals um, in uh, Dev 11 was to go through and treat JavaScript, CSS, both as first-class citizens, along with C# -sharp and VB that we're that we're used to. Yeah. Uh, I actually noticed that the CSS it does it does block comment, but it block comments wrong. Yeah. And now <laughs> it now it, now it does it correctly. Okay. Uh, but now you can uh, you know you can do block comments. You can do find references. Um, if you're in the CSS editor, it's pretty cool. If you do colors, you now get a color picker pops up. Oh, nice. um, awesome. I mean, for the first time, I think. CSS feels good, uh, JavaScript feels better. Uh, one of the common complaints we have in JavaScript is a lot of times, especially in a Razor website, uh, we don't have the ability to go parse and figure out what the uh, layout page is. Okay. So because of that, we don't know what scripts are actually included in the, in the page. Mm -hmm. And so how do we then provide you IntelliSense when we don't know what scripts are in the page? And so to solve that, uh, there's now a th part, in part of VS, you on your project, you can actually say, here are the script libraries that I want IntelliSense for. Mm -hmm. And we'll just give you those across the board, um, whether you're, you know. Whether it's in your project or not. Whether yeah, it's in a page. Whether, yeah, exactly. If you're in a, a master page or a layout page or, or, or okay. whatnot, it'll just work. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a, that's a cool thing. For the web form developer, it's one of my favorite areas that we, we, we worked in the editor is, I've never been a big fan of the design view myself. Um, I, I tend to like to write markup. Yeah. Um, and so I would, if I, if I was doing web forms work, the only time I would actually switch the designer was if I actually wanted to wire an event, um, like to a controller or something. Yeah, so double clicking a button. Double, cl or double click a button, or or uh, to go change one of those those other events, or or if you're using something like a form view or a grid or something that actually has a pop up dialog box, you know, you would you would go into uh, design for that. One of the features that we added in. Uh, Dev 11 is you no longer have to go into design view. Oh, okay. uh, in the source view, if you say on click, it's going to offer, it's going to go find any methods that match the parameters for that on the page, show them in a drop down, and it'll have at the very top, it'll have uh, create new. Nice. And if you do that, it'll actually wire it up, put the thing in the code behind file, and you're good to go. You can also move your mouse over the ASP colon, and when you do so, a little button will appear underneath it. You click that button, and whatever dialog boxes that we had, uh, whatever Chrome we had in the designer will now light up inside of the, the source editor. Nice. So you can really stay in the source editor all the time if you're a web form customer, just like you would if you were a, an MVC customer. Uh, yeah, that, that's nice. I, I like to work a lot in split view when I need to see preview things. But on a laptop, that's hard. Yes. Because so on a laptop, I really, I'm really almost forced to switch to one view. And I'm like you, I'd rather have the markup than the design just because I want to see it. Then another cool thing we've added is uh, there's something called Page Inspector. Um, people can go out and Bing or Google that if they want to go see the, there was a talk of that at the Build Conference. And what Page Inspector is, is it's a, it's a feature, um, it's kind of interesting. You launch your website, and then in your browser, whenever you move your mouse or highlight something, the source in Visual Studio aligns with what you just changed, what, what, you, what you did. Hmm. So think of, I'm, I just down the great example is these CMSs. Go download in Braco and go figure out which file you would go use to go modify one of the buttons on the screen. Oh, okay. You would never be able to figure that out. You run this thing in Page Inspector and you highlight the button. You just in the background so it shows the exact markup. That, oh, that uh, so I, I'm running into that issue with uh, uh, Scott Hanson, who works for you. Uh, he wrote uh, or he was a major contributor to DOS Blog. Yes. And I want to modify. The template page. And it's hard to go oh, find where to go. I, I spent, I, I'm not kidding, I spent probably three hours trying to find out where that template page was. I finally found it, but it was not intuitive at all. 
this would have saved us trouble. Yeah, so, so it works both ways. As you, as you move the cursor back and forth via either side, the, the, the two windows kind of stay in sync, okay. um, which um, sounds trivial, but as I said, yeah. go load some of these complicated projects up. I, I've actually worked on projects before where, where like, you know, we spend you know, 15 minutes just trying to figure out where something came from. Sure. Um, so that's a, that's a cool feature that we're adding in, uh, in Visual Studio. Um, and there's lots of other like, kind of side stuff going on as well. There's, there's better published dialog boxes coming for you know, Azure. Um, we want to make Azure deployment easier uh, inside of Visual Studio, so you can, just, you, know, you can expect enhancements there. Um, things that I think might be interesting for web developers is um, a lot of us use uh, EF code first. Um, Any framework. Any framework code first. Um, because it gives you some of the benefits of like link and stuff without all the you know, huge EDMX model stuff and metadata. So you got enhancements to that? Yeah, the, the enhancements to that are, um, I think some of it's been released publicly is they, they're adding migration support. Uh, that's a feature that people in Ruby on Rails are traditionally used to. Do you migration from what to what? So what that means is um, in EF code first, you basically write classes. So what I, instead of actually, I don't go develop design tables, I write classes. So I write a class called product and I have first name and last name in, inside of my product class. Okay. Then I go, oh man, I forgot to put quantity in. So I go back to my C, uh, C sharp and I add quantity. Well then how does that database table in the database get modified to add the quantity field? Oh, that's the migration from the right. classes back to the database. Yes, today, today the way that migration works is you, you tell it in any in, in framework code first to delete your table. And recreate your table so with migrations. Data that table. Yes, <laughs> with the data in the table goes, and so the idea behind migrations is, as you change the classes, the uh, not only will it actually modify the database, but in some cases you can actually put the the, rule, the steps on how it modified the database in the actual code as well. Mm -hmm. The benefit there is, if you know, you were mentioning DOS blog, which is a, it's a file-based uh, blog system, but if, but imagine working on a uh, something like subtext, which is Phil's hacks blog, yep. and he decides he wants to go add three new fields to a database table. Right. What he does is he manually scripts it all, and then writes an upgrade script that his customers can run. With migrations, you can basically say, all the rules on how to move from 1.1 one, one to 1.2 one, are part of the class. And so, it could basically look and say, hey, the database is 1.0, I'm gonna run the rules to go 1.0 one, oh, to 1.1, one, 1.1 one, one, one to 1.2, one, now I'm there. Love this. And, and that same feature is also exists for, for full entity framework as well. There's a, there's a, this, was a, this was always a problem that I had when I was using full entity framework was I would start with a database, I would create an EDMX model, and then I would go modify my database, and then I, I would have to go recreate my EDMX model because yeah. there's, no, there's no synchronization. Um, with some of the new tools that are in uh, Dev11, when you go modify the database, the EDMX automatically updates on the fly. Oh, really? If you modify the EDMX file, the database updates on the fly, so there's pure full synchronization going back and forth between both sides. Uh, today, you would, you would honestly, you'd buy a third-party tool that, that uh, would do that. Um, and so that's that's a sliver so, yeah, so of, of, of some of the stuff that's coming in uh, in the next version. We're we're excited about it. It's it's okay. And so so we don't have any information on when uh, Dev11 is coming out, but uh, the the out of band release of the MDC four. Red matrix, those are coming out when? Those are the, the out of band releases are currently targeted to come out somewhere in the April to May time frame. Oh. We should we shipped last year in March. Um, but I think it'll be April or May this year. But, okay. but that, that, that that entire stack of stuff, that's IS Express, Web Matrix, MVC, Web Pages, uh, Web Deploy, that entire and Web PI, that entire suite of stuff hopefully will will stay on mainly an annual, you know, rev cycle. So you can assume somewhere in the March, April, May time frame, probably every year. All right. Scott, thank you so much. You're welcome.